Hello everybody, Today, this is Chris with The Ancient Scholar. Today what I'm going to be talking about is something known as PEEP. And I've actually talked about PEEP before in a more uh, general sense, a uh, more broad sense, and, and I think everybody probably at this point has a pretty good idea of what PEEP is. It's positive index by or true pressure. And, um, and what it is is it's pressure that's always in the lungs. It never goes away. So uh, when I let's say when I take a breath and I inhale, Clearly, what what the pressure that I have in in, in exhalation um, is going to be overshadowed um, by the positive pressure that's being put in into my lungs through the, the ventilator. Because as we know, uh, most ventilators work on the principle of positive pressure, which is actually in direct opposition to how we would normally breathe and normal physiologic breathing. Now, PEEP is always pressure that's there, and and um, when we measure it or when it becomes relevant is when we exhale at the end of exhalation on the ventilator. Now there's there might be a pressure left over in the alveoli, in the in the interparonchial area in the lungs themselves, and whatever that pressure is, is is known as PEEP. Now there are two types of PEEP. There's something known as extrinsic PEEP and intrinsic or what we call auto PEEP. What I'm going to talk about now is extrinsic PEEP, and that is PEEP that we add through the ventilator, through the agency of, of a machine, the mechanical ventilator adds that. And then we'll talk about this concept of intrinsic or auto PEEP in a subsequent video. So, what does PEEP do? And I, I think everybody has a fairly decent idea of what PEEP does in a general sense, but um, let's just review that very quickly. What PEEP does is it... it adds pressure. It obviously produces a pressure that's always in the thoracic cavity and it's most relevant at the end of exhalation because that's when we see it. Because again, during inspiration, the PEEP, whatever pressure is left over, is, is completely overshadowed by the fact that um, I'm ventilating with a much higher pressure um, than this PEEP pressure. Um, so it doesn't really become relevant um, as much in, until we transition into the, the expiratory phase of inhalation. So, what does PEEP do? Well, if you remember from physics, uh, there's something known as the, the Young-Laplace equation, or what, we'll say, what we call often call Laplace's law, or the law of Laplace, and it is most relevant in this case. And basically what the law of Laplace says, or the, the, the Young-Laplace equation says, is that if I have a sphere, and I want to inflate that sphere, I want to make it bigger, the pressure that it takes and, and ultimately the work that I have to do to inflate that sphere is much greater when the sphere is very small versus when it's a little larger. Now, how does that relate to alveoli? Well, let's just do a gadonkin, a thought experiment real quick and think about trying to blow up a balloon. I try to blow up a balloon. When, where is the hardest, when do I have the hardest time inflating that balloon? Well, it's actually when I'm initially trying to get the darn thing to inflate. And this is somewhat analogous to what the Young-Laplace equation is telling us, is that as I, that initial attempt to get it inflated initially is hardest. I have, I'm having to do with the most amount of work. I'm having to put in the most amount of pressure. But once the balloon gets inflated a little bit, then it's much easier to put in subsequent breaths and make the balloon bigger. Well, this is a very similar concept when talking about the alveoli. When I have, uh, let's say, atelectasis and I have collapsed alveoli, the work that I have to do, the pressure that I have to put in to open those collapsed alveoli up is much greater than if the alveoli were already opened up a little bit um, on their own. So what we can do is we can add a little bit of PEEP in there, keep the alveoli partially inflated. I'm not saying the alveoli are going to be fully inflated, but keep them partially inflated, prevent them from collapsing, and what that can do is that can decrease the amount of work that, that the patient has to do and the ventilator has to do, and ultimately um, the, the, the amounts of pressure that I have to put in um, to open the alveoli. This is good. This can decrease work of breathing. Um, it can also decrease something known as shear trauma uh, because every time I inhale and I'm inflating collapsed alveoli and then they recollapse as I ex expire, as I exhale without the PEEP, they, then I have to 
basically force them open again, and then they collapse. I force them open again, and then they collapse. And that forcing open and that collapsing and that forcing open, can, it can lead to shearing stress on the alveoli and the tissue itself. And, of course, that can cause a cascade of changes to occur. So that's one thing PEEP can do. PEEP also increases the surface area of the alveolar capillary membrane, the AC membrane, and allows for increased diffusion of oxygen across that membrane. So PEEP is, is uh, one of the principal adjuncts that we use to assist with oxygenation. Now, obviously, there are many pitfalls to PEEP. Uh, barotrauma could be one of them. Um, I can off, uh, often um, cause hemodynamic consequences because I, I have a lot of positive pressure in the chest with PEEP. It, the pressure never goes away. That can put pressure on the heart. The major vessels that will decrease ventricular preload, which decreases cardiac output, and which decreases blood pressure, and um, can adversely um, alter our hemodynamics. So then the question comes into play, well, what is optimal PEEP for my patient? Where do I really want to be on my PEEP? And the answer, unfortunately, is it's going to vary from patient to patient, and we need to take it on a patient-by-patient -patient basis. So let's just do something called a PEEP trial. And this, what this is is I... I basically increase my PEEP gradually and monitor my patient and see how they're doing. So what we'll do is I'll just make a little table here. We'll call this a PEEP trial. And it's not uncommon to get asked questions on tests about this. So over here I'm going to have, uh, yeah, people can see that, my PEEP, my SPO2, my uh, pulse oximetry, I'm going to have my heart rate and my blood pressure. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start my patient on 5 a peep. And at 5 a peep, their saturation is 84%, their heart rate is 88, and we'll say their blood pressure is 140 over 84. So we, we notice that we do, we, we do have an oxygenation issue, and we need to, to take care of this. So what I can do is, let's say I increase my peep to 10 and my saturation will increase to 87%, maybe my heart rate is 94, uh, maybe my blood pressure is 130 over 70. So then I go and I increase it again to 15, uh, gives me 89%, maybe my heart rate goes to 98, 120 over 84, and then I increase my PEEP to 20, and I'm at 95% on my SAT, 115, and 80 over 44. Okay, so I've increased my PEEP, my parameters have changed, and I think the intuition for a lot of people is, ah, 20 of PEEP, awesome, 95%, I'm saturating well, I'm oxygenating well, this has got to be the optimal PEEP for this patient. What do you guys think? And hopefully you'd be able to pick up that Yes, my SAT has increased, but at the cost of my hemodynamics. You can see my blood pressure has significantly changed, heart rate has gone up, and um, I have a significantly changed my hemodynamic status, probably decreased cardiac output, clearly I've decreased blood pressure. So this is not an optimal situation. Yes, my saturation is good, but I have significantly affected my hemodynamics. So in this case, we'd actually want to look at 15. Even though my saturation isn't above 90 and it's not that, that beautiful 90% and above that we like, it is much better than it was initially. And my hemodynamic status hasn't been significantly altered. And generally, you'll see this with PEEP as you go up. You At some point, you get to a point where the patient is doing better. And then once you increase the PEEP above that point, your hemodynamics will, will be adversely affected. So in this case, 15 would actually be the optimal PEEP for our patient. And that's actually what we'd want to look at doing when we're, we're doing a PEEP trial or a PEEP test on a patient, is just going gradually increasing your PEEP, watching your saturation, watching your PaO2 if you have that ability, and then watching your hemodynamics. And at the, at the point that your hemodynamics begin to deteriorate, um, you need to recognize that your PEEP is no longer being therapeutic and you're actually causing um, atrogenic hemodynamic consequences. Okay, guys, so hopefully that, make, hopefully that makes some sense and hopefully that was helpful. 
uh, we'll go ahead and talk about auto peep um, in the subsequent videos.